But the reason you guys are here tonight is to learn more about the Missouri and the Mississippi River systems from one of um, really the, uh, the finest river scientists in the country. Um, we're lucky enough to have here in Columbia, Missouri, and Rob's given, Rob Jacobson is the uh, chief of the River Studies branch of the uh, Columbia Environmental Research Center, which is a US geological survey facility here in Columbia um, with many wonderful scientists. How many of you USGS people are in the house? A bunch of you, cool. That's cool. Um, well, Rob's given quite a few really outstanding presentations. I, I sort of feel like half of what I know about the Missouri River I've learned from Rob. Um, and he's also helped, you know, our education program a lot, um, not just Rob, but quite a few of those hands that were raised um, in going through our educational materials, making sure they make scientific sense um, and helping guide us to like uh, that sort of right scientific place. Welcome tonight, Rob Jacobson. Thank you, Rob. Can everybody hear me? Okay, this is working. That's very good. Um, when I was in grad school, the uh, department chair always picked the smallest seminar room for the seminars to make sure everybody who was there really wanted to be there. So it's, it's gr really gratifying to see the packed room here, and I'm glad to be the, uh, the guinea pig. So what I'm going to do while he's starting from scratch is talk a little bit about my motivation for this talk. Um, I've been working on Missouri River for a long time on technical aspects related to habitat dynamics and endangered species, and also helping to translate that information into management and decision making uh, on the river. And at several times in the past, uh, and at this time as well, I've been asked to work with the upper Mississippi River uh, in an advisory capacity to help them do some of their science planning. And one of the things that really struck me, should I try it? Yeah, so far so good, there we go. One of the things that really struck me and really got me puzzling was how different these rivers are. Now these two aerial photos are exactly the same scale. And so obvious there's a big difference between these, these rivers. Missouri River is very narrow. Uh, whereas the Mississippi River has these, these big pools on it. But in addition to that, the management decisions that are being made on these rivers and the way that conservation biology is used uh, are very, very different on these rivers. And so I put this together, together this talk to evaluate what is responsible for those, for those differences. Yeah, and so, so what I'm gonna do in this talk is I'm gonna start off with a little bit of geography because river geography is really fundamental to this whole story. And I'm going to go through some history, because history is also fundamental to it. And then I'm going to work into some of these issues about how science and conservation uh, efforts vary between the, the two rivers. So we'll just, I'll just, okay, next. Now, first, a little bit about geography. Um, I'm looking mainly at the upper Missouri, Mississippi River compared to the Missouri River. Uh, but there is some difference of opinion about what the Upper Mississippi River really is. So you click. So uh, the Upper Mississippi River is actually from St. Louis up. But many times the Middle Mississippi between St. Louis and the confluence with the Ohio River is also grouped in there with the Upper Mississippi. But I'm going to be looking mainly at the Mississippi in the strict sense from St. Louis on up to uh, St. Paul. Click. And I have to tell you, I see this map a lot for the Upper Mississippi River, and it really, really offends me. And the reason is, click, it neglects that, which is the big brother, the Missouri River Basin. And so that brings in 68% of the sediment that's in the Mississippi River at St. Louis, 40% of the water, 28% of the nitrogen load, and 38% of the phosphorus load. So if you're interested in the middle Mississippi here, you better take into account the Missouri because it has a really big influence. Next. But conveniently, if you look at these two rivers side by side, you look at St. Louis to Yankton or St. Louis to St. Paul, Minnesota, two rivers side by side that are pretty good set up in the mid-continent of the United States to compare uh, the two rivers. Next. 
So that map that I said offends me actually shows up in many agency documents and many uh, scientific articles. And um, it's very surprising to me that, that people kind of kind of get away with that because it really um, misleads folks about what's happening, especially in the middle, uh, the middle Mississippi River. All right, now some, yeah, that's, we'll start there. So, so some very fundamental geography. The Missouri River Basin is a lot drier than the Mississippi River Basin. So you can see by these colors here, which are color-coded according to the amount of precipitation they get. And these bubbles are um, proportional to the amount of water, the, is the water yield of the different river basins. And I added the Ohio in here just to show the comparison. The Ohio is very wet. The upper Mississippi is less wet. And the Missouri, most of it is very, very dry. Next. So that you have uh, a uh, mean annual flow at Grafton on the Mississippi River, 105,000 cubic feet per second. Cubic feet per second, anybody not know what a cubic feet per second is? It's a basketball going by one a second. So that's 150,000 of the 105,000 of them. The mean annual flow at Herman is 94,000 cubic feet per second. When you add those together, St. Louis is about 220. But what's coming down the Ohio, which is another story, and not really my story today, there's another 300,000 CFS coming down the Ohio. The Ohio really is pumping out the water. The design flood for the Mississippi below the confluence of the Ohio is 3 million CFS, which is 2 million coming from the Ohio and 1 million coming from the Mississippi. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about that. The Missouri River is, even if you just start at St. Louis, it's the longest river in the United States, right? And if you were to follow the longest one, then the Mississippi is a tributary to the Missouri and the Ohio is a tributary to the Missouri. But we'll, we'll, we won't get too far down that road. Another big difference is the um, oh, sort of, you know, the geologic framework. Most of the um, upper Mississippi basin is, is glaciated, which means it's got some really sponge-like materials in it that can really sop up the water and let it out relatively slowly. It does have this window in the middle. That's the driftless area. The glaciers miss that area, and it is famous for producing a lot of sediment. But the unglaciated part in the western part of the Missouri basin is also very famous for producing a lot of sediment. My wife, Anne, I love her dearly, she said, no graphs. You can tell stories, but no graphs. But I decided that it'd be okay to tell a few stories with graphs. And this particular graph is really important. This, this gets at where is sediment produced? Where do you get sediment? And sediment's a big player in this story, the overall story. So. Um, we've got on the x-axis here, that's the amount of precipitation. So if it's zero, that's very dry and there's no sediment being produced. On the other hand, if you have a lot of precipitation, you can have thick vegetation, and then you're not going to get very much sediment produced. But there's a sweet spot in the middle between about 200 and 500 millimeters of rainfall, annual rainfall, where the, there's enough water, but the vegetation is very sparse. And that's where you get the most sediment yield. And I've colored that in yellow here. And you can see that the Missouri River Basin is dominated by that. And as a result of that, the Missouri River Basin has been a, has forever been a tremendous producer of sediment. Why is that important? For a variety of reasons. Okay, next slide. Why is sediment important? Sediment is important because it's a primary control on the gradient of a river, okay? If you have a lot of sediment, the river adjusts and increases its slope so it can transport that sediment. So on the x-axis here is the distance in river miles that I've shown upstream to the left and downstream to the right because that's the way I think about the Missouri River flowing. And the y-axis is the elevation of the river and the blue is the Mississippi and the red is the Missouri. And you can see the Missouri has twice the gradient of the Mississippi. That's extremely important for this story. Um, 
And you can see in the blue here, you can see a couple of bumps in there. That's because there are locks and dams on the Mississippi. I'm going to show that in more detail later, but I want to let you know what those, those bumps were. Okay, hit it, Steve. Pray. Next. Okay, now. This is a little complicated slide. It's good. Look at the history of the two river basins. Uh, Mississippi River's on the bottom, Missouri River's up on the top. What I've shown in the middle here is just general period of when steamboats were active, starting in the early 1800s and then petering out uh, around the 1900s, when the railroads came in and started to really dominate uh, commercial uh, transport. And then the advent of diesel tows and the reinvention of navigation on the rivers like the Missouri and, and the Mississippi. And at the bottom, this is the history of, of the Mississippi River where the, the explorers first came, Jolet, Marquette, the LaSalle. And then uh, starting in the 1850s, working on that channel for navigation and moving up from a four foot channel to a six foot channel to finally saying in 1930, we need to have a nine foot deep channel for navigation on the Mississippi River. And then on the Missouri side, uh, a little bit later, getting started with Lewis and Clark in 18, early 1800s, and then going through the same sort of thing. Well, let's do a six-foot channel to Kansas City. Let's do six-foot to Sioux City, et cetera, until the uh, Flood Control Act and the Bank Stabilization Navigation Program in 1944, where they finally said it's going to be nine feet, 300 feet wide, all the way up to, to Sioux City. So both rivers, um, so in both rivers, there is dredging and snagging to help clear that uh, navigation channel, click on that. And then channel training, wing dikes and navigation structures were also popular in both rivers. Uh, the Missouri River, they called that the Sutter Plan, and it was sort of the European way about creating a navigation channel. And the big difference, though, occurred in the 1930s on the Mississippi River, where they went to locks and dams. And instead on the, Missis on the Missouri River, the decision was to go with hydrologic regulation, large reservoirs to provide more water to float the barges. And the reason for this is, comes back to sediment. The, the feeling was, the concern was at the time that they built locks and dams on the Missouri River with that really heavy sediment load, they would just fill up with sediment. And so it would not, not work on the, on the Missouri River. So they went for, Reservoirs instead. This is a map of all the uh, ponds and reservoirs in the, uh, in the basins here, but these are the ones that are important. In green, these are navigation locks and dams, so they're relatively low elevation and they are used for passing barges through. And so you see them on the Ohio and the uh, Mississippi. And in yellow, those are the storage reservoirs, the higher reservoirs, and you see those dominantly in the, in the Mississippi River or the Missouri River Basin. So in the Missouri River Basin, this is what was used instead of locks and dams. Channel training, but also providing more water so that those barges could stay afloat. So this is the largest reservoir system in North America. It's got 91 cubic kilometers of storage in it. So that can hold a year and a half worth of water uh, if that were to come down all at one time. It generates a lot of, uh, of hydropower along the way. Um, and that hydropower connects things in the Missouri River to things outside the basin. But one of the things that's happening outside the basin recently, and you've heard a lot of this, in fact, over the last year or so with drought in the West, is uh, even though the uh, Missouri River Basin is relatively dry, it has all this storage in it. So there's a lot of people looking at that water and thinking, okay, we can use some of that water. So there's already a project to move water from Lake Sakakawea into the Red River of the North and on into Canada. And the, um, there's been a feasibility study done to take water out of the Missouri River, pipe it to Denver. And if that can be done, which is very expensive, it's only a feasibility study, but if you could do that, then Denver could give their water back to the upper Colorado, which could then help Phoenix and LA and, and uh, Las Vegas. And then there's also the idea of the central Kansas diversion the idea that flood, flood flows could be skimmed off the top of the Missouri River, and that could be diverted to central Kansas, where it could be used to infiltrate and recharge the Ogallala Aquifer to help support irrigation. And earlier this spring, there was a group that filled up a tanker truck in Kansas, drove it, filled it up with Missouri River water, drove it to central Kansas, and dumped it on the, on the land in some farmer's fields just to demonstrate that this could be done. 
But although there's a lot of water stored there, it brings in the fact that how the decisions about how that water is used is very, very contentious. So I often use this quote in my talks, talk about you know, how, um, how, how in incredibly contentious water can be in the, in the Missouri River Basin. But I did get concerned at one point because I really couldn't um, document that Mark Twain had actually said this. So I, uh, I went to a friend of mine, uh, not, not Jacques Cousteau, who's on the right there, but to his, his left, Henry Sweets, who was the, uh, he's retired now, but he was the curator of the Mark Twain Museum in Hannibal, Missouri. He was also my high school chemistry teacher. And he finally decided he didn't like teaching high school chemistry. And then he went on to get a master's in, in, in uh, history. But anyway, I checked with Henry and Henry said, no, nobody's ever documented that Mark Twain said that. It's kind of like a thing Mark Twain would say. And he might have said it, but it's not been documented. It's a good quote anyway. So one of the big differences about water in the two different basins is how water is used in Missouri versus how water is used in the Mississippi. So these graphs, sorry, Ann, uh, these graphs show the day of the year on the x-axis. And I've got these bands on here, the two red bands and then the, the bands with the blue there. For each day of the year, that's the range of flows that are um, come out and are measured in the river 25% of the time to 75% of the time. So it's, a, it's the range over a period of years when you get those flows. And what you can see on the left here is that the natural hydrograph, the unregulated pre-1938 hydrograph, shows a whole bunch of water coming down in March and a whole bunch of water coming down in June. And the red shows what happens with those reservoirs are in place. What they do, what reservoirs are meant to do for flood risk reduction is take those big peaks off. But also in July, September, and November, they have that increased flow. And that's what's happening on the Missouri River to float barges uh, instead of uh, locks and dams. Now, the graph on the right is interesting. There's a really long record from Keokuk, Iowa, and I was really surprised when this plotted up this way. I separated it in 1878 to 1940 and 1967 to 2002. And they don't have storage reservoirs on the, um, or very few storage reservoirs on the Mississippi River. And those, those navigation pools don't really store water. They pass water right through. So you don't see any change in the seasonality of flows. But it is interesting that more recently, there's more flow on the Mississippi River than there has been in the past. Now I'll get back to that uh, towards the end of the talk. So sediment's a really big deal. Um, th these are arteriograms where this is the, the, the channel network, but the width is proportional to the sediment load. And this is a classic work that was done by Bob Mead, who retired from USGS many years ago. And it shows that circa 1800, before the dams were put in, the Missouri River was providing most of the sediment to the Mississippi River. Very little coming from the Mississippi, very little coming from the, from the Ohio. Then when the dams were put in and all that sediment was stored, uh, the, the source from the Missouri was cut down quite a bit, but it's still providing most of the sediment to the Mississippi River. And because of land use practices, uh, the, the, the Mississippi River and the Ohio River are somewhat thicker than they were back then, indicating that there's higher sediment loads. We did a, a look at some of these sediment loads and updated them in 2009. So we showed that before the dams were put in, there's 320 million tons of sediment coming down the Missouri River every year. And after the dams were put in, that is 55 million tons. So it's only 17%. It's called the Big Muddy. It is a Big Muddy River but it is nowhere near as muddy as it used to be. And then some of this work was done by my colleagues uh, from Kansas City, and they came up with slightly different numbers, but showing that St. Louis has about 91 million tons a year. So about two thirds of that sediment is still coming from the Mississippi River. And then other things that happened, this is a famous painting from the Missouri River, but snagging went on in the Mississippi as well. Let's get all these big snags out of the river so we can float some barges and this, graphic, of course, you can never have a Missouri River talk without showing this slide. Uh, this shows the channelization process 
on the Missouri River. So they narrow the river down. So it's, uh, you know, about a half to a third is as wide as it used to be, concentrating the flow to maintain sediment transport, to maintain a navigation channel. And in map form, here's Herman in 1894, and this is what it looks like today. So this is the channel training aspect of what's the dominant method with hydrologic regulation on the Missouri River. And there is some of this on the upper Mississippi River, but not, not uh, as much. And so for folks who've been out of the Missouri River, of course, you know that all these little things here are rock structures that focus the flow and maintain that navigation channel. So that was the decision is to go that direction instead of locks and dams. In the Mississippi River, starting in the 1930s and going up to the 1960s, the, um, the, the plan instead was to put these locks and dams in place. It was a tremendous engineering uh, process to do this. So now, this is the staircase map of the uh, Mississippi River, again, going from left to right from St. Paul, Minnesota, the upper left, to right around St. Louis in the lower right here. And you can see, because of the vertical exaggeration, you can see every single one of these locks and dams. Depending on how you count them, there's either 26, 27, or 31. Um, so it gets a little complicated. But um, you can see that this is the way that the navigation was, was uh, that nine foot navigation channel was achieved on, on, the, Missouri, on the Mississippi River when it was not done the, like this on the uh, Missouri. Now the highest dam here is uh, at uh, Keokuk, Iowa, Lock and Dam number 19. And you see in yellow underneath there, that hump, that was an actual large rapid that existed in the river. And by putting in that, very high dam there, they were able to cover that up and provide opportunities for the, uh, uh, for the boats to get through there. So every single one of these then has become like this. This is an example from Pool 8. I use Pool 8 in a lot of examples because uh, the USGS office in La Crosse has done a lot of work on, on Pool 8. So at the top there, you can see Lock and Dam number 8 in red. And then there's a section of free-flowing river about a third of free flowing river, and that's where there are wing dikes in there. And then there's a transition zone, and then there's a big pool at, at the bottom. And that's repeated 26 times on the Mississippi River. And so it's created a very, very different ecosystem than what existed there naturally. And it has some benefits, and it has some, uh, some uh, disbenefits as well. Um, this will be the last graph. Um, so bear with me on this one. So what I want to do here is I want to just show how much habitat exists on the Missouri River, typically, compared to how much habitat exists on the Mississippi River, typically. So the x-axis is discharge compared to the median discharge, which is just to say that if there's a three on here, the discharge is three times the median discharge. So, and the reason I do that is I'm comparing different places on the river. So, so this normalizes that discharge axis. And then the y-axis is aquatic habitat, hectares of wetted habitat per kilometer so that we can compare different places. And so a typical channelized system, the discharge increases and in, in very little habitat gets created because it's channelized. It's a narrow river. There's nowhere for the water to go until it gets to going up over bank. Then it spreads out and you get more of that habitat. Um, this is what it looked like in 1894. We had a hydrodynamic model we used to simulate in 1894. And it shows that there was more habitat and it increased pretty steadily as discharge increased. And then one of the uh, nice things to see on this river system is in places where restoration has taken place. And some of you may know this. I saw Tom Ball earlier, there he is. Uh, this is the Lisbon Jameson, uh, part of the Big Muddy National Fish and Wildlife Refuge here in gray. It's a restored reach. So there's a lot more habitat than in the channelized reach in that area. So it shows that, yes, we can create more habitat on the Missouri River. So that's a, it's a good thing to show that progress can be made. I'm, I'm now going to quickly do some magic. So keep your eye on the y-axis. Notice that there's 200 at the top. Now it's 400. 
This is that same relationship for pool eight of the Mississippi River. An order of magnitude, more habitat at all those discharges. And you think about it, it just makes sense. You've pooled it up, you create a lot of wetted area, which means there's a lot of wetted habitat for waterfowl, for fish, for water skiing, for a whole bunch of stuff. What was that? Oh, hey, don't steal my thunder, David Galat. Just wait, wait for the punchline. So, um, what are, the, what are the, the implications of these different kinds of trajectories in development? So real river habitat, like the Missouri River, supports things like the Missouri River 340. You can have bunches of boats going down the river. They're not having to go through locks and dams, right? That is recreation that is supported by a real river. Um, the Missouri River also supports uh, people who go out after really big catfish in aluminum plate boats, you know, real... Um, sort of uh, river rat kind of people. In contrast to the upper Mississippi, where we have tour boats, lots of um, sporty boats with inboard engines and fiberglass hulls, and in the clear cold, cold water in those areas, uh, competitive bass fishing instead of competitive catfish fishing. Um, one of the big differences is uh, in, in how things can develop along the Mississippi River. The pools spread the water out so it doesn't go up, which means that cities like Davenport and Dubuque that are right along the river can develop real estate right down next to the river. And these, these river towns are really nice this way. Some of these areas need to be flood-proofed somewhat, but they don't have to worry about the kind of flooding that we see on the Missouri River. This is one of my favorite places uh, at Cooper's Landing. You see 30 feet of bank there. And even with 30 feet of bank, every two or three years, it floods. So it's hard to develop that kind of like recreational infrastructure in the Missouri River floodplain that they're able to do along the pools of the Mississippi River. And of course, commercial navigation varies between the, the two rivers. Uh, we do have commercial navigation, obviously, on the Missouri, but the toes are bigger, uh, much bigger on the, on the Mississippi River. So to, just to show you some numbers here on these two different metrics about the socioeconomic differences about development of these rivers. Recreation dollars on the Mississippi, $2.5 billion a year. Compared to the best numbers available on the Missouri, the four states on the lower Missouri River, 32 to $63 million a year. In other words, a ratio that's below Gavin's point that does not include the lakes. Uh, but that's a 53 to 1 ratio, 53 times as much recreational revenue on the Mississippi River compared to the Missouri, until the 340 really gets going. And then... <laughs> so much money there. Though. Yeah. And navigation, 83 million tons a year on the Mississippi, 40, uh, 4.5 million tons on the Missouri. So that's a ratio of 18 to 1. So those locks and dams have also created socioeconomic benefits for the uh, Mississippi River that really outstrip uh, the Missouri. Corey, did you want to say something? Uh, it goes way up because people do like to spend money on lakes. You know, we see that Lake of the Ozarks, and that's true for those main stem lakes as well. So they're real generators of recreational dollars. Okay, a little aside here, it has to do with restoration, because even though a lot of people in the Mississippi think that it's a great system, they don't need to quote unquote restore it, there are other folks who are trying to restore more of its natural habitat. So we talk a little bit about restoration. This is a great article that was written back in 1995, basically said, you can't restore these large rivers. The word is wrong. Uh, because of all the socioeconomic benefits, restoration back to some pristine condition is probably not practical. There's a considerable potential for rehabilitation. So it's really about using a different word. Rehabilitation, recreating some of the habitats to some extent, but not getting anywhere near to pristine condition. So it sort of sets, sets expectations for what can happen on these highly engineered river systems like both the Mississippi and the Missouri. This paper, 1999, I really like, though, because it talks about 
restoration and rehabilitation says they're, they're not even really the right words. Naturalization is a better word. And this concept, I think, really fits these rivers. Um, a viable management goal for watersheds in landscapes characterized by intensive human modification of the biophysical environment. Completely describes the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. Implicitly acknowledges that the concept of natural is a social construct and that each community socially negotiates an appropriate mix of the human and the biophysical components in the local landscape. So with that audit, you know, you start looking at it that way, then this is no longer scientists or resource managers going out and saying, we're going to do it this way towards some goal or another. It's really what the stakeholders, the people who live there want. It brings in this idea, you have to do this collaboratively. Um, so I'm going to show a pretty complicated slide here. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it. I'm going to skip over some pieces of it. But it gets to that whole issue of how the social negotiation has taken place on these two river systems and how different it is. So um, again, Missouri River at the top, Mississippi River on the bottom, 1940 to 2024 on the uh, time axis here. And some events that affected both rivers were really big, Clean Water Act. That cleaned up the non-point sources on both these rivers. We still have a problem with, or cleaned up the point sources on the rivers, still have a point, a problem with non-point sources, but that was really big in terms of water quality uh, for these rivers. And then the Endangered Species Act, which looms very large, of course, in, in the Missouri River, but also has affected the Mississippi River. And then a couple of listings here, the Turn and Piping Plover and the Palace Sturgeon, which is listed in 1992, um, affecting, affecting both rivers. If we look at the upper Mississippi River, Conservation was an important aspect of it from the very beginning. The Upper Mississippi River Conservation Committee was established in 1944 while those locks and dams were being filled and built. And they started saying, we have to make sure that what happens here does not negatively affect fishing and hunting and other recreational values for the Upper Mississippi River system. And so that was from the very beginning, an important voice on the Mississippi. And the Mark Twain National Fish and Wildlife Refuge was established about 1958, was also part of that, providing land where a lot of those values could, uh, could be encouraged. The Upper Mississippi River Basin Association was created in 1982, and that became an advisory body at the state government level with, with, with uh, state government uh, representatives to the Corps of Engineers and the Fish and Wildlife Service about how the Mississippi River should be, uh, should be managed. And they instituted the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program in 1986 and the Long-Term Resource Management Program, which is the LTRM. The LTRM is, is um, mainly uh, work that's done by USGS, the office in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin with state agencies to do long-term monitoring of the status of the entire upper um, Mississippi ecosystem. And they started in 1986 and they continue to the present. Now, there have been some things along the way that sort of upset some of the things like uh, Jeopardy opinion for the biological opinion, several floods. But what's been amazing to me is that these groups, the UMRCC, UMRBA, and the LRTM are long lasting efforts on the upper Mississippi River that have been supported over the long term and are continuing to be supported today. Compare that to the Mississippi River or the Missouri River. Um, Flood Control Act and the Bank Stabilization Navigation Project in 1944, the dams were constructed in the 1950s, the reservoirs were full in 1967, and then the states started arguing about how to manage the water and manage the river system. For a while, there was the Missouri River Basin Association, lasted about 10 years, but they could never come to consensus, and so it was disbanded, and that was replaced by the MBSA, the Missouri Basin States Association, which also lasted a short period of time and was later disbanded because they, they couldn't come to the upstream states and the downstream states, couldn't come to consensus on recommendations for managing the system. The Bank Stabilization Navigation Program was actually completed in 1986, and then kind of see up there, it says uh, mitigation program, which was 19, well, so BSMP was completed in 1981 and the mitigation program began in 1986. 
the mitigation program was a holistic restoration effort to buy land and try to restore it back to its natural condition. So really restoration in the, the, the strict sense of that term. And it was very much like the upper Mississippi River, River Restoration Program. Um, and I just, just for historical purposes here, I wanna point out this thing called MoReap up here. That was the Missouri River Environmental Assessment Program. It was designed to be a long-term monitoring program on the Mississippi River, on the Missouri River. It was introduced in legislation but it never went anywhere. It was designed to look a lot like the LTRM, long-term monitoring of fish populations and vegetation and invertebrates and the whole thing so you can really understand what the ecosystem is doing. Um, so Steve mentioned I'm retiring soon. It was, this is really weird. I was cleaning my office out yesterday and I found a copy of a letter from my, my late friend, David Shore, who at the time, was the director of the Missouri DNR. And he wrote this letter to Richard Opper, who was at that point representing the Missouri River Natural Resources Committee about the MoReap. And he said, is the board willing to ask Congress to spend $100 million on biological monitoring, which would bring no benefit other than long-term employment for a small army of biologists? Bear in mind that these funds are for monitoring and focus studies only, no problems would actually be solved. And um, that is actually quite prescient because one of the criticisms of the LTRM is that no problems are being solved. They have, as I'll tell you later, they have a very nice long monitoring program, but the information doesn't help them make decisions. Well, on the Missouri River, through a whole variety of events here, the fiasco of the spring rise, Eighth Circuit Court decisions, amended BIOP, NRC report, then Eidecker lawsuit, and the, the new Missouri River Science Adaptive Management Plan. I'm not going to go into this detail, but this is in the Missouri River saying the science has to really focus. It can't be just monitoring of stuff. It has to be very, very focused. So the difference between these two really comes down to Missouri River species focused, and most of that recently has been on pallet sturgeon, uh, has a smaller biophysical capacity, so there's less, less opportunity to, to negotiate compromises in the Missouri River, and as a result, a very contentious system. Um, the Mississippi River is habitat and ecosystem focused. They have a larger biophysical capacity and they're less contentious. My colleagues in state agencies that work both in the Mississippi and, and the Missouri say, these Mississippi people, these are the happy people. And Missouri, not so much. And this may be a consequence of that. So uh, Missouri River has been going on long, Mississippi River has been going on longer since 1986. Uh, and you can see sustained funding and a recent increase. Uh, and what's happened is when we start out the Missouri River Recovery Program, started out gangbusters, but the last six, eight years have really been moving downhill. Um, so it just hasn't had that, even, even though it's very focused science, it, the, the contentiousness and the lack of consensus in the basin. This is all federal funding from the Corps of Engineers budget. Um, and then I have here a little asterisk exclusive of NESP. NESP is the Navigation and Ecological Sustainability Program, which was um, authorized in 2007, but has not been appropriated until this year when it was, it got money from the bipartisan infrastructure law this is supposed to be used for building expansions to, to, the, um, to the, the uh, locks on the Mississippi River, but also doing more ecological restoration. And David was part of the uh, science team that worked on that. And I believe right now they're gonna expand locks, but I don't know if they've got any ecological restoration planned with that money, but that's about $300 million. With what? I think so, yeah, yeah. And those, those, those numbers are not in here. This is just the recovery program.
it's yeah it doesn't appear to be the case right now yeah so um i'm going to talk a little bit now about what restoration means practically on the missouri and mississippi river and i'm going to focus on the pallet sturgeon because that's the the poster child for uh, restoration uh, on the Missouri River. And so the historical range uh, is on the left there. And the dams went in, and as a result of the dams, the range has been fragmented. And so there's a population of the sturgeon in the upper river in the, in the lower Yellowstone, but there's no recruitment, meaning that there's no measured population growth in that area, natural population growth. In the lower river, there is nearly zero recruitment, but a little bit happening. And then downstream, there's a concern that there's hybridization going on with this, with this fish. So the pallet sturgeon cannot get into the Mississippi because the Mel Price Lock and Dam. So the Mississippi doesn't have the benefit of having a rare and dangerous species in it. Instead, that benefit is all over on the Mississippi side. And even if Mel Price Lock and Dam wasn't there, it's possible that there would be very few fish up there because this is the confluence right here. And you can see the sediment coming down the Missouri River on the left and the clear water coming down the Mississippi River. The pallet sturgeon is adapted to a turbid river environment. So they're always going to go for where that uh, turbid water is coming from. So sediment has created the, um, the, the, uh, issue that needs to be addressed on the Missouri River about what to do about the pallet sturgeon. So just a little background on pallet sturgeon. The adults migrate hundreds of kilometers upstream. They spawn over coarse substrate. The eggs get fertilized and they incubate over four to seven days. Then those free embryos drift downstream for as much as 14 or 15 days, which means that it's going downstream, if you do the math, hundreds of kilometers. And then they settle into habitats and eventually they survive to age one and then they go through that cycle. If they get to age one, their subsequent annual survival is 65 to 90% on that order. But in the first 14 days of their life, 0.02% or less. And that's why the science and the management of the Missouri River has really focused on 14 days of a little, little tiny fish. So one of the hypotheses and one of the management actions that's proposed to help out that fish is something called interception rearing complexes. And the hypothesis is that those fish can't get out of the navigation channel. The navigation channel is optimized for transporting sand. And the little fish can't get out according to this hypothesis. And if they can't get out, then they can't get, when they need to start feeding, they can't get into those areas. So it's a hypothesis, but it's the hypothesis for which management actions have been um, focused on the, on the Missouri River. So fish would be spawning up near Omaha to Sioux City, but they would be likely settling out downstream of Kansas City. And um, this management action uh, to create what are called the interception rearing complexes, um, it's a uh, I think uh, a lot of interest to us. So right outside of town here at Huntsdale, Searcy's Bend, uh, upper right-hand corner there is the new Nature Conservancy in Missouri River Center, Missouri River Leaf River Center. And this is the Searcy's Bend Interception Rearing Complex. In red are places where they notched dikes. In green are places where they extended dikes. And the whole point of doing this is just to try to get more complex flow so those little tiny fish could get out of the navigation channel and into supportive habitats on the side. So um, just a public service announcement, Thursday from 5 to 7.30, I think, in the Runge Center in Jeff City is a public meeting for another interception rearing complex that is slated to be built at Plowboy Bend. So just upstream of Cooper's Landing. Uh, this this is from this area right up here, and just shows a a, uh, a computational model that we have. This shows the way that putting those notches in there and changing the length of the wing dikes can create new pathways to get these little tiny fish in there. My point though is that 
all this effort, and we're talking tens of millions of dollars, are being spent to try to understand and try to promote survival of these little fish only 20 millimeters long. Very, very focused on that life stage. Um, and I set that up as sort of a contrast to the Mississippi River. Mississippi River restoration is more focused on diversity, resilience, and, and based on a historical model of what the river used to look like. So here's 1947, one of the pools. And this is the sort of the reference condition for quote unquote restoration of the Mississippi River. But this in fact is when the dam is already in place, this navigation dam is already in place. And this was a time when uh, a lot of the folks interested in fishing and hunting thought this was perfect habitat because it had just been filled and that water had created very complex habitats around all these topographic elements, all these, these islands in here. And so that became the reference condition, the design ideal for, uh, for rehabilitation in the upper Mississippi River. And the reason for that is by the time 1985 came along, all of that original topography had been wiped out. A lot of this was through uh, just wind-driven erosion. And this is one pool, but this happened in every single pool that a lot of that habitat was lost. And so the restoration activities on the Mississippi River have really been pushing towards one, one element is to put that back. And the way they do that is to put a lot of rock structures out here to interrupt the wind, interrupt the currents, to allow sediment to accumulate, to create these islands, to create the diversity for waterfowl and, and fishing habitat. So that's one thing that they've been doing. There are dozens of these projects on the Mississippi River. Um, another thing they've been doing is dredging areas to make them deeper. And this is for mainly for fish habitat. So here's an area before it was dredged and here's an area after it was dredged. And the idea here is to create these connected habitats in the main channel, make it deeper and make those good overwintering habitats for, for native fish species. But this is in contrast to those very specific and parsimonious ideas about restoration, very reductionist ideas about restoration of the Missouri River, more holistic, more ecosystem-based on, uh, on the Mississippi. So um, a couple of uh, summary slides here. The causes for the divergence in these two river systems, one of the big ones absolutely is sediment. The sediment load being so much heavier on the Missouri River really, uh, um, really constrain the ability to, um, to do things like locks and dams on the Missouri River. Um, and there's scarce water, scarcer water supply on the Missouri River, which means that there's always gonna be contentiousness about using water to create habitat or using water to, uh, to float barges. Combined, we end up with a narrow channel, a reduced aquatic area, compared to what happened on the Mississippi where the channel expanded out and you created all sorts of aquatic habitat. And this results in perception that in the Missouri River, it really is a zero sum game in the sense that there's so little room on the river that if you create habitat someplace, the perception is that that's going to detract from other uses of the river, particularly navigation, dredging, and uh, bank stabilization. Um, and the Mississippi River, there's just more, much more opportunity for identifying common ground among the various groups that are using the river. Now, for, in terms of science, the Mississippi River has one of the most robust ecosystem monitoring programs in the river system that I'm aware of, um, with a focus on habitat diversity, multiple objectives, resiliency. So if you wanted to ask somebody on the upper Mississippi River, show me a graph of what's happened in the native fish community over the last 30, 40 years, they can do that. They're not so good at saying, how did that structure you built help native mussels? So they've taken this broad approach rather than the reductionist approach. On the Missouri River, it's the exact opposite. It, Missouri River has one of the most robust adaptive management programs globally, but it's laser focused on exactly what the palace sturgeon needs, not a holistic idea of what's the ecosystem doing, what does the ecosystem need? Um, there is a pivot going on though, um, for the work I've been involved in with the long-term resource management project. I see that they're more interested in, in doing science that's gonna help 
design structures on the Mississippi River. But one of the reasons for pivoting of both the Missouri and the Mississippi is the recognition of climate change. So I've got two records here. This is a Gavin's Point. So this is water going into the Missouri River system. And this is annual. So a lot of times when you have these hydrologic records, it get really noisy and the stats get very difficult. But this is just looking at annual water. So it's, it's wet years and it's dry years. Uh, from the 1900s up to the present. And then Keokuk, Iowa, the same thing. The blue line is the median flow, median annual discharge, annual runoff. And the black line is a locally weighted sort of a, uh, running uh, mean, running average. And what both of these records show is that the wet years are getting wetter, substantially wetter. And in the Missouri River, they're substantially wetter than the design criteria for the reservoir system. As well, the difference between the wet years and the dry years is increasing, that interannual variability. So in both these river systems, it's gonna get more and more difficult. If this trend continues, as we suspect it will, it's gonna get more and more difficult to manage the highs and the lows. And what this has done on the Missouri River has prompted a new thing that is pretty exciting. I have some concerns about part of it. But it's the idea of creating levee setbacks. Instead of having levees right up next to the river, move them back, give the river room to move, provides more resiliency, especially if those wet years are going to increase all the time, getting, getting bigger. They're very expensive, um, but they are being looked at in a number of places along, along the river to provide more flexibility. Not that they're going to give up on any of the in-channel Apparently, they're not going to give up any in, in channel rehabilitation requirements for the pallet sturgeon. But one of the things that this setback does, it helps the farmers out because they're not fighting the higher water. But it also means that if there's an effort to create um, an additional flow for the pallet sturgeon, there's not as much at risk. So it lowers the risk profile for those farmers for some restoration activities. And then on the Mississippi River side, I've, like I said, I've seen this, this sort of sort of pivot. Uh, they've been doing lots of habitat rehabilitation, including this really interesting mandala that they, they, they did up here, which is really based on let's create diverse habitats, but not knowing how that really affects, does it really help the population, the fish, does it help the population of birds? And now they're coming around to say, okay, we need to do better in uh, figuring out the, the details, get more towards what's happening in the, in the Missouri River. So to sum up, Upper Mississippi and the Missouri River have had uh, very different pathways. Missouri has become increasingly reductionist and species specific and the Mississippi has been more holistic um, and more concerned with resilience. Um, ultimately the difference between these rivers, even though they're right next to each other, ultimately this really comes from the physical framework with the major emphasis on the role of sediment supply. Um, and it's unlikely these two rivers are ever going to really converge and have conservation strategies that match each other, but there certainly is an opportunity for the two river systems to learn from each other. And what I mean for that is that, for example, in the Missouri River, when they started to be concerned about invasive carp, there's no long-term data set for invasive carp on the Missouri River because nobody's been measuring it. Mississippi River has a long-term data set that includes captures of native carp because they uh, Asian carp because they were putting together this holistic uh, uh, monitoring process. So the first time I gave this talk was to the Upper uh, Mississippi River Conservation Committee, and the first question I got when I was done was, "Yeah, but which river is cooler?" and and I know I was I was very uh, diplomatic up there because I talked to the Mississippi audience and I said, well, you know, Mississippi's got some good things going on. Missouri River's got some good things going on. But the more I think about it, and I'm not pandering to people in this audience like Dr. Galat. This is a river and the upper Mississippi is not. It's a series of pools. And one of the real benefits of the Missouri River with all the problems that it has is it's part of a 2,000 mile non-fragmented moving body of water that goes from Gavin's Point Dam all the way down to New Orleans. 
So I really do think that the Missouri River is a cooler river. So thank you. Thank you for your time and for. For, uh, for, for patience and getting through our, uh, our technical difficulties. And uh, if folks need to get up and, and leave now, I'll completely understand, but I'll also stick around and answer questions or try to answer questions. Are we gonna do a microphone for the questioning people? I cannot hear it either. Testing. Oh. All right, that sounds better. Diane has a question. We have to play past the microphone. So um, my question is about the adjacent history. When the Missouri River was channelized and the land agreed it, the adjacent farmers acquired land at no expense of, to themselves. What happened in the Mississippi when they built the locks and dams to the adjacent farmers? What did what happened there? That's a good question. I don't know the detailed answer to that. I know that uh, on the Mississippi River, there's much more federal land along the river that has flowage easements on it. So I don't know if there was that same history. So I have to claim ignorance of that. Yes, some of the contentiousness, of course, is that uh, the, that land that was accreted is the property of the landowner. And it's treated as something that they, um, it's their, to their benefit. And if you take that away from them, that could be another takings under the Fifth Amendment. Oh. Yeah, um, I'm concerned about the Asian carp. And uh, I'm wondering, has there been any study of what their relationship with sediment load is? Um, I have two pictures of sediment load in the Missouri and Mississippi River. Yeah, I could talk about that a little bit, but uh, right behind you here is the world's expert on Asian carp, invasive carp. But I'll just start off by saying that invasive carp tend to like the less turbid water. They like clearer water than, say, the pallet sturgeon. And I would ask Dwayne Chapman if he wants to uh, pile in on that question. Yeah, pretty much what you, what you just said there, Rob, that... Uh, the big head and the silver carp in particular are they need the primary productivity that arrives from light penetration. So where you see carp, the the carp on the Missouri River, uh, they they tend to be located in places of low turbidity, and they so the lower turbidity definitely helps the carp, but um, still the Missouri River is so muddy that it is a terrible place to live if you're uh, if you're an, an invasive carp, if you're a big head or a silver carp. And uh, so the fish in this river grow really slow, but on the downside, they reproduce really, really well. And so that's why we have such a large number of small carp in the Missouri River. Yeah, clear rivers like the Illinois and the Mississippi are much better habitat for these invasive carp species. Um, this Thanks. is a, a comment on the first question about the uh, Mississippi. The, it's another interesting story. When the Mississippi, remember now, on the Mississippi, when they put in the locks and dams, they flooded land. And on the Missouri, when they channelized it, they created land. So on the Mississippi, when they flooded that land, the deal was made. Most of that land went into federal fish and wildlife refuges for the public. And on the Missouri River, when they created land by the navigation um, project, that went to the adjacent landowner, public versus private. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, well, I have an easy question potentially, and then well, uh, never easy. more challenging. <laughs> uh, is the Missouri River more or less turbid than it used to be in a natural state, given the sediment reduction, the water quality, not just the sediment load, like TSS, I guess? Yeah, so most of the contribution to turbidity is sediment turbidity. You can have turbidity also from phytoplankton 
in algae in the water column, mm -hmm. but most of the, the turbidity in the Missouri River is, is from sediment, and it is less than it used to be. But there are times in the season when the sediment turbidity gets lower on the Missouri River, and then you can start to see green water. Mm -hmm. And that's, you do have phytoplankton can grow under some conditions, and that creates a different kind of turbidity. But most of the turbidity is sediment related. Okay, and then the uh, second question is, uh, so like the difference between the river management and both river systems, how much of that is kind of uh, the human component and a reactionary government management process from criticisms received by stakeholders that serve each river system? Uh, is is that a part of the story at all? I think it is. And I think in the Mississippi River, you don't have as many stakeholders who are critical of the government because it's just a bigger pie for so many stakeholders. You know, you can, main, you can maintain navigation. You can have all the economic benefits and ecosystem benefits of having all that water and the water skiing and waterfowl hunting, et cetera. And the government hasn't done those as many things that tick people off. Whereas the perception on the Missouri River, as I pointed out, is it's sort of a zero sum game. And there's always somebody who's angry because they think that their benefits are being diminished. And one of our questions as scientists is, is that true? And how can that be quantified? Maybe there's more common ground there than we recognize. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. <laughs> yeah. um, so last question is on the IRCs and uh, you mentioned this, like the hypothesis that potentially we could get the palisturgeon to settle out in those areas to therefore hopefully reach that higher percent chance of likely is from your experience with your, you know, the wisdom that you have of these rivers, uh, is that hypothesis a good place to go at this moment in time? Um, or do you think that there's other better alternatives or worse alternatives or considering the circumstances, where, where do you think that they have landed? So there's a short answer to that question and a very long answer to that question. Um, in 2018, I uh, was a team lead for something called the effects analysis, where we went back and said, what do we know about the palaturgeon? What do we not know? What do we need to know? And we wrote a bunch of reports that became the new biological opinion, the new biological assessment, and became part of the new operating plan for the Missouri River. And that's where we developed this hypothesis with a series of experts, came from the expert opinion about, you know, we don't know what's wrong with the palace churgeon, but if we had to guess, therefore it's a hypothesis, we think that this is probably one of the things to look at. And as a result, the Missouri River Science and Adaptive Management Plan has a robust um, sampling and monitoring and science effort looking at a variety of ways about whether that hypothesis holds water or not, but it's still early in the process. We don't have uh, as much data right now to, we, to make a decision on that. So it's still a viable hypothesis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a, if you'll indulge me a minute, about feedback on microphones, the closer you hold it to your mouth and the more you point it away from the speakers, the easier it is to control feedback. So when I was a geology graduate student 20 years ago, my advisor gave me a piece of advice that was whatever you decide to pursue, make sure you can tie it to climate change because that's where the money is. So my question is, that's true of many aspects of science. And I get the sense that the Endangered Species Act has had that effect as well. You know, you pointed out that Missouri is very hyper-focused in palisturgeon, which probably relates to the Endangered Species Act, creating a, a conduit for funding that focuses science because science runs on funding. Do you have a sense of whether there is likely to be a change in the approach of funding or priorities that would allow Missouri River science to become more diversified away from the pellet sturgeon, sort of more like well, what's the mechanism by which that happens if the traditional funding model is endangered species? Yeah. The uh, thanks, Eric. There's a lot of sort of questions embedded in that. And, and so I'm going to answer some of them and probably not answer others. But I'll start off by saying that the Endangered Species Act is about recovering species and the ecosystem on which they depend. And so one of the ideas the Fish and Wildlife Service has had is that you have an endangered species, you understand what its relationship is to the ecosystem. If you can get that fish to be recovered, 
and maintain its population, you're probably doing something good for the ecosystem and that would broaden things out. What's happened on the Missouri River is though, it's gotten narrower and narrower and narrower, just exactly what's needed at that specific life stage. Um, but one of my last slides was about uh, the levee setbacks. And what's been happening is, you know, for years and years, farmers have gotten flooded and the point of the fingers, the federal government, in fact, that's the Eidecker Farms lawsuit where the judge decided that the, fe the federal government was responsible for flooding 2007 through 2019. Um, but farmers have been fighting the flooding for a long time. And so now they're starting to think, well, you know, if we actually gave up some of our farm ground, some of the secreted land and moved it, moved the levees back, that maybe things would be easier for us. At the same time, there would be more ecosystem benefits. So that's also pushing, I think, in that direction. Now, I see these things being driven mainly by legal issues like the Endangered Species Act rather than funding, because a lot of Endangered Species Act questions are out there that don't have a lot of funding behind them. But they're the questions that are central to things like how do we manage the Missouri River system, which has hundreds of millions of dollars a year of annual benefits. And endangered species management is in the way. So there's an economic benefit to doing that work. Did that come close to answering any of your questions or at least provide some context? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> Two things. One kind of a response to that question is one of the interesting things on the Mississippi is that there are, I think, five states, and those states have generally when it comes to funding, have responded in a unified fashion to go to Congress with their congressional delegations to get funding for the long-term resource monitoring program. So that's why you saw that long timeline there because there's a group collective support with a, with a lot of political clout. Missouri is almost the opposite. You've got upper basin states fighting against lower basin states. You've got lower basin interests that are against the restoration programs. So they go to Congress and cut the funding for the program. So that's a fundamental difference. That's a sort of a socio-political issue. That's just the way it is. And part of the reason is, is that you're talking about a huge basin on the Missouri with interests that are much more diverse than on the Mississippi. Um, so that leads into my question that maybe you, you could explain to the audience is you've got locks and dams on the Mississippi and you've got big reservoirs on the Missouri. Could you share with what it is about the upper basin of the Missouri Rocky Mountains precipitation that uh, might affect that versus what occurs in the upper Mississippi basin? Uh, under climate change conditions? No, just... A, it's, oh, okay, well, the, the, one of the, the big geographic things is that the upper uh, Missouri basin is dominated by snowmelt hydrology. And so snow, for, if you're a hydraulic engineer, snowpack is like having a whole other reservoir. And so understanding where the snow is and how much snow is there helps a lot in the management of the system. Um, the snow on the Northern Plains, like in Minnesota, in fact, this spring was an example. There was a lot of snow up there and it melted very fast. And that's why early spring this year, there was flooding on the Mississippi River. Um, and they don't have the reservoirs in place to, to capture that like they do on, on the Missouri River. So the hydrology is fundamentally different. Does, does that get out to your question, David? Uh, there is a question from Andrew Miller online. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, if that's the Andrew Miller, I think it is. We went to graduate school together. He's a long, long friend of mine. He'll awesome. ask a very difficult question. <laughs> well, he was uh, in, in line with the climate change questions that are going on. He was wondering, 
If there's much discussion about the impact, the effect of anticipated changes in water temperature in these rivers on habitat conditions and the resilience of species populations. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, there are models that have been run uh, looking at the effects of climate change on, on water temperatures. Um, some of the effects of, of climate change on water temperatures are mitigated strongly by the reservoirs themselves because they let water out from the bottom. It's called a hypolimnetic release and it's cold water. And so if I was concerned about keeping temperatures low in a river system for fish populations, I might want to build more reservoirs so I could dial in more cold water. So that's an implication of that. Um, but for the, uh, for the, the, you know, the overall question what happens to the uh, water temperature, it's a combination of what happens to the hydrology plus the heating of the water and it gets complicated. Generally the thought is there's gonna be more water in the Mississippi and Missouri River basins under climate change than there was before and that it's gonna be warmer by and large, but it will be mitigated by the, by the reservoirs. And the lock and dam system, um, does that end up heating the water more? Well, it actually does because those, it's very shallow and well mixed and the water is spread out. So there's more insulation. So I would say, yeah, it's a good point. I think it'd probably be more of an issue on the Mississippi than on the Missouri. Oh, there we go. I just want to say thank you. As a snowbird to the Gulf Coast for everything that is going on up here that has an effect really, really downstream. Mm -hmm. And get that, you know, we're taking the whole northern perspective, but the southern perspective is uh, where a lot of things land. And I know you people have all been up to your elbows in mud and uh, on the computers, writing these grants and publishing studies. And I thank you from the other end. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, Rob, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being a great audience. I really appreciate it. And um, thanks to all of you guys for coming tonight. Um, and we are taking a month off from the Big Muddy Speakers series in August. So we don't know where September will be, but we'll be playing around with that idea and throw it out. So hope to see you guys all soon. And thank you so much for coming out and squeezing yourselves in here to, to listen to Rob's wisdom. So thank you. <laughs>